LibriVox.org. Roughing It by Mark Twain. Chapter 54. Of course, there was a large Chinese population in Virginia. It is the case with every town and city on the Pacific coast. They are a harmless race when white men either let them alone or treat them no worse than dogs. In fact, they are almost entirely harmless anyhow, for they seldom think of resenting the vilest insults or the cruelest injuries. They are quiet, peaceable, tractable, free from drunkenness, and they are as industrious as the day is long. A disorderly Chinaman is rare, and a lazy one does not exist. So long as a Chinaman has strength to use his hands, he needs no support from anybody. White men often complain of want of work, but a Chinaman offers no such complaint. He always manages to find something to do. He is a great convenience to everybody, even to the worst class of white men, for he bears the most of their sins, suffering fines for their petty thefts, imprisonment for their robberies, and death for their murders. Any white man can swear a Chinaman's life away in the courts, but no Chinaman can testify against a white man. Ours is the land of the free. Nobody denies that. Nobody challenges it. Maybe it is because we won't let other people testify. As I write, news comes that in broad daylight in San Francisco, some boys have stoned an inoffensive Chinaman to death, and that although a large crowd witnessed the shameful deed, no one interfered. There are seventy thousand, and possibly one hundred thousand, Chinamen on the Pacific coast. There were about a thousand in Virginia. They were penned into a Chinese quarter, a thing which they do not particularly object to, as they are fond of herding together. Their buildings were of wood, usually only one story high, and set thickly together along streets scarcely wide enough for a wagon to pass through. Their quarter was a little removed from the rest of the town. The chief employment of Chinamen in towns is to wash clothing. They always send a bill, like this below, pinned to the clothes. It is mere ceremony, for it does not enlighten the customer much. Their price for washing was two dollars and fifty cents per dozen, rather cheaper than white people could afford to wash for at that time. A very common sign on the Chinese houses was, See Yup, Washer and Ironer, Hong Wo, Washer, Sam Sing and Ah Hop, Washing. The house servants, cooks, etc., in California and Nevada were chiefly Chinamen. There were few white servants, and no China women so employed. Chinamen make good house servants, being quick, obedient, patient, quick to learn, and tirelessly industrious. They do not need to be taught a thing twice, as a general thing. They are imitative. If a Chinaman were to see his master break up a center table in a passion and kindle a fire with it, that Chinaman would be likely to resort to the furniture for fuel forever afterward. All Chinamen can read, write, and cipher with easy facility. Pity but all our petted voters could. In California they rent little patches of ground and do a deal of gardening. They will raise surprising crops of vegetables on a sand-pile. They waste nothing. What is rubbish to a Christian, a Chinaman carefully preserves and makes useful in one way or another. He gathers up all the old oyster and sardine cans that white people throw away, and procures marketable tin and solder from them by melting. He gathers up old bones and turns them into manure. In California he gets a living out of old mining claims that white men have abandoned as exhausted and worthless, and then the officers come down on him once a month with an exorbitant swindle to which the legislature has given the broad general name of foreign mining tax, but it is usually inflicted on no foreigners but Chinamen. This swindle has in some cases been repeated once or twice on the same victim in the course of the same month, but the public treasury was not additionally enriched by it, probably. Chinamen hold their dead in great reverence. They worship their departed ancestors, in fact. 
Hence, in China, a man's front yard, back yard, or any other part of his premises, is made his family burying ground, in order that he may visit the graves at any and all times. Therefore that huge empire is one mighty cemetery. It is ridged and ringled from its center to its circumference with graves, and, inasmuch as every foot of ground must be made to do its utmost in China, lest the swarming population suffer for food, the very graves are cultivated and yield a harvest, custom holding this to be no dishonor to the dead. Since the departed are held in such worshipful reverence, a Chinaman cannot bear that any indignity be offered the places where they sleep. Mr. Burlingame said that herein lay China's bitter opposition to railroads. A road could not be built anywhere in the empire without disturbing the graves of their ancestors or friends. A Chinaman hardly believes he could enjoy the hereafter except his body lay in his beloved China. Also he desires to receive himself, after death, that worship with which he has honored his dead that preceded him. Therefore, if he visits a foreign country, he makes arrangements to have his bones returned to China in case he dies. If he hires to go to a foreign country on a labor contract, there is always a stipulation that his body shall be taken back to China if he dies. If the government sells a gang of coolies to a foreigner for the usual five-year term, it is specified in the contract that their bodies shall be restored to China in case of death. On the Pacific coast the Chinamen all belong to one or another of several great companies or organizations, and these companies keep track of their members, register their names, and ship their bodies home when they die. The Si Yup Company is held to be the largest of these. The Ning Yong Company is next, and numbers 18,000 members on the coast. Its headquarters are at San Francisco, where it has a costly temple, several great officers, one of whom keeps regal state in seclusion and cannot be approached by common humanity, and a numerous priesthood. In it I was shown a register of its members, with the dead and the date of their shipment to China duly marked. Every ship that sails from San Francisco carries away a heavy freight of Chinese corpses or did, at least, until the legislature, with an ingenious refinement of Christian cruelty, forbade the shipments as a neat, underhanded way of deterring Chinese immigration. The bill was offered, whether it passed or not. It is my impression that it passed. There was another bill, it became a law, compelling every incoming Chinaman to be vaccinated on the wharf and pay a duly appointed quack no decent doctor would defile himself with such legalized robbery, ten dollars for it. As few importers of Chinese would want to go to an expense like that, the lawmakers thought this would be another heavy blow to Chinese immigration. What the Chinese quarter of Virginia was like, or indeed what the Chinese quarter of any Pacific coast town was and is like, may be gathered from this item, which I printed in the Enterprise, while reporting for that paper. Chinatown. Accompanied by a fellow reporter, we made a trip through our Chinese quarter the other night. The Chinese have built their portion of the city to suit themselves, and as they keep neither carriages nor wagons, their streets are not wide enough, as a general thing, to admit the passage of vehicles. At ten o'clock at night the Chinaman may be seen in all his glory in every little cooped-up dingy cavern of a hut, faint with the odor of burning josh lights, and with nothing to see the gloom by save the sickly, guttering tallow candle, were two or three yellow, long-tailed vagabonds coiled up on a sort of short truckle-bed, smoking opium, motionless, and with their lusterless eyes turned inward from excess of satisfaction, or rather the recent smoker looks thus, immediately after having passed the pipe to his neighbor, for opium-smoking is a comfortless operation and requires constant attention. A lamp sits on the bed, the length of the long pipe-stem from the smoker's mouth. He puts a pellet of opium on the end of a wire, sets it on fire, and plasters it into the pipe much as a Christian would fill a hole with putty. Then he applies the bowl to the lamp and proceeds to smoke and the stewing and frying of the drug and the gurgling of the juices in the stem 
would well nigh turn the stomach of a statue. John likes it, though. It soothes him. He takes about two dozen whiffs, and then rolls over to dream. Heaven knows what, for we could not imagine by looking at the soggy creature. Possibly in his visions he travels far away from the gross world and his regular washing, and feast on succulent rats and bird's nests in paradise. Mr. Ah Sing keeps a general grocery and provision store at number 13 Wong Street. He lavished his hospitality upon our party in the friendliest way. He had various kinds of colored and colorless wines and brandies, with unpronounceable names, imported from China in little crockery jugs, and which he offered to us in dainty little miniature wash-basins of porcelain. He offered us a mess of birds' nests, also small, neat sausages, of which we could have swallowed several yards if we had chosen to try, but we suspected that each link contained the corpse of a mouse, and therefore refrained. Mr. Singh had in his store a thousand articles of merchandise, curious to behold, impossible to imagine the uses of, and beyond our ability to describe. His ducks, however, and his eggs we could understand. The former were split open and flattened out like codfish, and came from China in that shape, and the latter were plastered over with some kind of paste which kept them fresh and palatable through the long voyage. We found Mr. Hong Wo, number 37 Chow Chow Street, making up a lottery scheme. In fact, we found a dozen others occupied in the same way in various parts of the quarter, for about every third Chinaman runs a lottery, and the balance of the tribe buck at it. Tom, who speaks faultless English, and used to be chief and only cook to the territorial enterprise, when the establishment kept bachelor's halls two years ago, said that some time Chinaman buy ticket one dollar hap, catch em two tree hundred, some time no catch em anything, lottery like one man fight em seventy, maybe he whip, maybe he get whip, he self, welly good. However, the percentage being sixty-nine against him, the chances are, as a general thing, that he get whip he self. He could not see that these lotteries differed in any respect from our own, save that the figures being Chinese, no ignorant white man might ever hope to succeed in telling t'other from which. The manner of drawing is similar to ours. Mr. C. Yup keeps a fancy store on Live Fox Street. He sold us fans of white feathers, gorgeously ornamented, perfumery that smelled like Limburger cheese, Chinese pens, and watch-charms made of a stone unscratchable with steel instruments, yet polished and tinted like the inner coat of a seashell. As tokens of his esteem, C. Yup presented the party with gaudy plumes made of gold tinsel and trimmed with peacock's feathers. We ate chow-chow with chopsticks in the celestial restaurants. Our comrade chided the moon-eyed damsels in front of the houses for their want of feminine reserve. We received protecting josh-lights from our hosts, and dickered for a pagan god or two. Finally we were impressed with the genius of a Chinese bookkeeper. He figured up his accounts on a machine like a gridiron with buttons strung on its bars. The different rows represented units, tens, hundreds, and thousands. He fingered them with incredible rapidity. In fact, he pushed them from place to place as fast as a musical professor's fingers travel over the keys of a piano. They are a kindly disposed, well-meaning race, and are respected and well-treated by the upper classes all over the Pacific coast. No Californian gentleman or lady ever abuses or oppresses a Chinaman, under any circumstances, an explanation that seems to be much needed in the East. Only the scum of the population do it, they and their children, they and naturally and consistently the policemen and politicians likewise, for these are the dust-licking pimps and slaves of the scum, there as well as elsewhere in America. End of chapter 54